This is a Nabu 1600. I know it doesn't look like the Nabu that we're familiar with, but these were the machines that were developed prior to the, uh, the Nabu that we all know, because Nabu is trying to actually build out a computer that they can put in an office setting. And this was one of the two machines that they built to do that. There was the 1100, I believe there might've been a 1200 as well. 1200 and 1600 might've been the same thing. They are 8086 based and they ran one of a few different compatible operating systems with the CPU. Um, Xenix and QNX and CPM86 and I guess maybe a form of DOS, but there is no video card on here. This is a serial console only. So I wanted to dive into this and get it working. So I wanted to take you along on the trip to do that. Now, as you could tell here, this is like all my Nabu stuff, some sort of prototype. It has some custom ROMs on it that uh, I guess my father would have programmed back in the day. Now, I don't know if this thing works. We don't know anything about it. So I feel like it's today's a day where we're just gonna turn this thing on and see what happens. Now, you know me, I grab my camera. <laughs> These are not professional videos, but I just want you to come along and see the journey firsthand, essentially through my eyes. And thanks to Dave Dunfield's website, we have some archived brochures from the 1600. Now, as you can see here, this is definitely promoted as a business machine. It is the beginning of the new era of computers, the Nabu 1600. Then we have uh, obviously your 80s secretary who's doing her data processing. She's got a, uh, now I don't know how many people are familiar with the way Nabu started. If you check out nabu.ca, I do have a lot of links to some interesting information about the, the origin of Nabu but it was a combination of a few different companies. So this could be a Volker Craig, um, cause that was one of the companies that was actually acquired and merged to make Nabu. Now, given the little sticker emblem there, that does look like a Nabu emblem, you know, it's been uh, rebranded. And then we have a printer here that also looks like it's sporting a Nabu <laughs> logo here that you see on all these machines. And here you have a similar office environment where they're showing off the Nabu and uh, being used by multiple people. And this is a neat, neat ad here demonstrating how you could hook up the three terminals. So they were really pushing the networking feature, even their little logo thing up here of some sort of networking. So they were definitely pushing that and that's not unlike Nabu. Remember, this is before the Nabu PC that we're familiar with, which was developed to use the cable modem system. So when you think about it, it's in their genes from the, the get-go to have this multi-user, multi-operating uh, environment. And then they do promote a few different products here. You can see that they are mentioning, um, let's see, the floppy drive, the hard drive, I know it's hard to read here. So the 1600 has a pretty detailed specification document, which you can find available. And I'll throw a lot of this stuff up on the forum.nabu.ca, but we can find a little bit about it here. It's an 8086 based at 4.9 megahertz, so five megahertz running machine. Um, it does support an 887. Now, as you can tell from looking at my version here, I don't have an 887, but that might be fun to order and get one from eBay. Um, there's other information here, which you're probably gonna need when, it come, when we break it down into getting an operating system running, specifically because I don't know if we're gonna be able to get hold of any system disks, disks for this thing. So we're gonna probably have to either modify an existing CPM or hopefully cross our fingers and maybe Leo has something, you never know. In this 1600 hardware specification processing unit document, we can find out that there is a mass storage device that would be sold separately um, for this thing to connect to. And you can see here that it uses an LS1 floppy controller but if we read here, we'll find out that the mass storage device actually included a WD-1001 controller. So there is no controller for a hard drive in here. However, for floppy, there is a controller built into it. 
and all we would need to find is a tandem TM. Now that would be a double-sided, double density, 800K, so that would be one megabyte per drive. Um, now, I don't know if GoTech or what uh, floppy emulator we can use to emulate a TM, uh, TM100-4. So if you guys know, let me know in the comments. <laughs> now, I do feel like I'm a little bit crazy because I could be doing this a lot easier right now. I do have a USB to um, uh, DB9 adapter in my storage locker here in Calgary where I am right now. But since I've pulled out this old laptop, I thought this would make a good uh, terminal for me to use, even though it's so difficult for you guys to see. Now, <laughs> what I think is funny is first off, I didn't have a null modem cable to make this work. I have a straight through DB25 to DB9 cable. But thankfully, because of the RS422 adapters that we needed for the original NABU, I had this uh, DB9 to DB9 cable that I built for a video where I was using a logic analyzer to record the communication to evaluate the baud rate. So by switching pin two and three on here, I was actually able to repurpose the uh, adapter that came with the RS422. It was just something that I just saw sitting here and thought to myself, okay, we'll swap these over. And the manual that came with the DTEC for us, RS422, you can see here that pin one, pin two, pin three, those were all broken out on our little breakout terminal strip. So I was able to build a null modem cable. Now, I also decided I wanted to do this because I had some free time <laughs> because I am actually, as you can see, the little lights flickering on this, I am actually copying a whole ton of games from my Windows PC to my Windows 95 laptop and I'm getting an astounding 17 to 15 to 20 kilobytes per second. <laughs> so it's gonna take a while. So while I thought it's gonna take a while, maybe I figured we can turn this thing on and see if it works with HyperTerminal. Now, I was going to use one of my other options. I have a um, IBM Terminal Info Window 2, as well as a really fantastic candy laptop that also has a really nice clear screen that you guys can probably read better than the one I'm going to be using. So using this, to connect to this piece of hardware that's been sitting in my dad's basement for the last almost 40 years, I figured <laughs> this would be more suiting to use um, this old laptop. Okay, so we're gonna set the baud rate to 9600. That's what I guess this is gonna be at. So I'm gonna push uh, enter here to load it up. Now I'm gonna turn on the NABU. Oh, look at that! Okay, so this is giving us something, but uh, the ROM is doing something. There's some sort of test it's doing. It's looking for the hard disk controller. Well, good luck on that because we don't have a hard disk controller. I found on Dave Dunfield's website, this document that is about the 1200, which technically that's what this is, the 1600 and 1200 are the same. Now this ROM is a custom ROM. As you saw, it was handwritten labels on it. So we're guessing that there might be a few modifications, but we don't know how many. So I'm just gonna keep hitting the escape key here. I ditched Hyper Terminal because it's garbage. And I got Kermit running now in DOS. And I was able to hit the escape key, check it out. We now have a NABU 1600 onboard monitor version one. Now it does say version one, which is interesting because these chips look like it says maybe version two. Either way, that now gives us a interface where we have some commands that we can type in here. For example, we can do a display memory, which is DM. So let's take a look here. So display memory. DM, we enter the starting address the, and the ending offset. So why don't we try that out? So DM space, we'll start at one, two, three, four, and we'll just 
f f so we'll print out 256 bytes let's see if that oh look at that right on now i don't know where the rom sits but we should be able to see some rom and let's see if that's mentioned in here someplace i browsed through the manual for the monitor a little bit and i couldn't find anything about the rom address so i just bounced around through a few different memory addresses and didn't see anything either so we do have things where we can examine ports so we can write and read from a port but that's not very interesting to do um, we can do something with a memory test so that should be kind of neat we can see what happens there so if i type in tm then each pass takes two minutes okay so there it goes. Not a lot of exciting news there, but at least we can see if the RAM on this machine works. So I guess the next step for getting this thing running is to uh, find out if I can get a GoTech or something to emulate the uh, one, the Tandem 100-4 floppy drive. Um, that looks like it'll connect to this port here. And as you can see, there are four terminals. No, three terminals, sorry. Um, I'm not sure if you can use the printer as a terminal. I don't know if it's parallel or serial or what. But what's neat is once we get, uh, say, QNX or Xenix on here, I'd love to see Xenix run on here. I'm guessing Leo is going to write a message on the comments and say, I want to see QNX on here. Because <laughs> I know he loves QNX. Now, Leo does have some software for the 1600, so we might be able to get this thing running with what he has. But I first need to emulate a floppy disk. And once I could do that, then we can look into emulating a hard disk. But there is no controller in here. I'll need to get the WD-1001 controller hooked up externally to a emulator of some sort. I also think in the next video, maybe we should pull out my, um, here we go, I got a couple different ROM readers here. So we should probably pull out one of these guys, or that guy or something, and read these ROMs and then put them online so we can archive what we got there. Okay, we'll see you guys on the next video.